Hello and welcome to a special bonus episode of the History of the Germans. And today we have a real treat ahead of us. I'm here with Professor Carsten Janke, Associate Professor at the Saxo Institute at the University of Copenhagen. And Professor Janke is the author of two books I have ruthlessly exploited in the making of our recent series on the Hanseatic League. These are his mercifully short but fact-packed Reklam Sachbuch Die Hanse and his Habil Dissertation Netzwerke im Handel und Kommunikation an der Wende vom 15. zum 16. Jahrhundert. It's Professor Janke's work where I found the stories about Bernd Pahl and Hans Selhorst, the two merchants from Rival, modern-day Tallinn. And these two have been our constant companions for a few episodes as we try to figure out how the Hanse network operated. But this is not the only area of Professor Janke's research. One other focus of his work is the history of the perception of the Hanse throughout the centuries until today, a story almost as fascinating as the history of the Hanse itself. Professor Janke, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Thank you very much for this nice introduction, and I'm really happy to be here. And it's one of these wonderful things I can talk about in hours, so you have to stop me. Oh, you shouldn't worry about that. You're amongst people who've just spent 20 episodes listening to me talking about the Hanseatic League, so they're well hard. <laughs> Let me start with a question that's more of an apology. I named the season the Hanseatic League because that's how this history is usually referenced to in the popular literature in the UK. Now, I do understand now that to misquote Voltaire, the Hanse was neither Hanseatic nor a league. Can you explain why these terms are wrong? Our, the, the term of the league means a strong political leadership. It means war and enemies and so on. And the, the Hanseatic League has neither been a strong political entity nor have it been a, a strong economical unity. So um, you can call it this. It's the normal word we use in history. But I will say to call it the, Han the Hanse, it's much more appropriate because it's take out uh, the political impact. Yeah, I realized that I was working my way through the Hanse and I sort of started to reduce the usage of the word Hanseatic League and replace it with Hanse wherever I could. So if it's not a Hanseatic League, what was it then in reality? Today, we will say it was a loosely coupled network. It is a network of, of cities which by free will uh, came together when they have use of uh, community, when they have the use of political backup by other cities. But uh, it was not so strong that they were, could be forced to come, for example, to Hanseatic diet. And Lübeck was uh, neither the queen of the Hanseatic League. It was more the, the constant secretary. I have no idea if you can remember the constant secretary of the Communist Party in Soviet Union. So Lübeck's role is nearly the same. Well, that would be a very powerful role as the constant secretary of the <laughs> Communist Party, right? Uh, yes, yes. As so Lübeck was able to use it, to misuse it for their own purposes. And uh, they invested a lot of money, I have to say, because all the uh, uh, diplomatic correspondence and so on was, was led by Lübeck merchants or Lübeck councillors. So they invested a lot of this yeah, trademark, to say, but they were not the queen or the king of this of this league. Right. I was just wondering, because, you know, when I read through your books, I had the impression that you're describing almost sort of two separate networks. There's a network of the cities that are connecting, and then there are the networks of the individual merchants that sort of operating underneath. So they are not quite the same thing, are they? No, the merchants are the, the economically driving forces. And the hands are, were made by the merchants and they are networks. They work together to force their interests on foreign places in place, to, uh, to reframe the, the ways of trade. And by this, they formed this league by their own interest. And later on, these merchants and with their networks, they became councillors, city councillors, and they integrated the cities and the city, the urban politics into an urban network pol uh, polity system, which is called the Hansa. I really, really enjoyed the way you sort of described the way the networks worked and the um, uh, the different merchants interacted together. 
and you know, I'm I'm an ex-banker, so yeah. you know, my my worldview is uh, is rather cynical. So um, what has really fascinated me is that you know, most of the time, the Hansa merchant would have a significant chunk of money from his associates, partners, etc., in his in his safe, and it seems very few of them sort of you know took it and um, disappeared into the sunset. I mean, if they had, then obviously we would have a banking system, uh, which which we didn't. So, um, what is it really that's kept them on the straight and narrow? Uh, this network was based on trust, and you have to enforce trust. No one is trustworthy at all. So, um, all merchants were supervising each other constantly. It's like a huge Big Brother uh, society where each one is writing about the behavior of the others. So uh, the whole system just worked because it was controlled by the members of the, met of the network. So everyone has, was forced into the line. No one was able to step out of the line because if you're uh, struggling or if you're embezzling money, everyone will know it. And by this, no trade with you would be possible anymore. So uh, it's a constant, I, I will not say like the Stasi in, in GDR, but it's, it's, it, has, it has contours of this. So when we are looking at the, Latin, uh, the, uh, the letters of the merchants, they're constantly reporting the behaviors of their colleagues and they are constantly you know, struggling about this is bad and this is bad and so on. And by this, they forced trust in place. Wow, so it's just social control. And that feels like, you know, it's a million miles away from a modern economic system where we control agents through, you know, essentially legal processes and um, commercial retaliation, where we share information through, you know, broadly accessible platforms. A really sort of, you know, quite fundamentally different model. This is actually the, the result of the dissolvement of the Hanseatic League. In the 16th century, when the League was, was not longer economical, so successful, the, the network disappeared. And by this, suddenly, banks, stock markets, public information like uh, uh, the, the stock market, newspapers and so on, uh, came in existence. And they are the substitutes for the Hanseatic network. Yeah, I, mean, I felt it was one of the most compelling things about the um, the history of the Hanseatic League. It wasn't driven by kings, princes, bishops, popes, or, or, or rather exalted people that we find very difficult to connect with, but by you know by individual merchants. Some of them very successful, some more in middlingly successful. And I really warm to the to the personalities that you describe about Bound and um, and Horst Seelhorst, and I. Yeah, I feel almost connected to them. So I'm, I'm wondering, where did you find them? How did this actually happen? Because I don't think I've seen them written up by anybody uh, else. You know, at least not before you've written them up. So, so how did you find them? By chance, by chance. When I was writing my PhD, I, my my doctor father sent me to the archives in Tallinn once. You have to go there. You have to go there and. It was in, in the end of the 1990s, uh, was quite an amazing time in Rival because it was the dissolvement of the Soviet Union and so on. And I was working there and so I found this, these letters. And on the first hand, I took just the things out for my PhD, but I thought, okay, that's so much, that's so an expressive uh, convol convolute of different thoughts and letters. You have to do something with this. and. Um, then I came back and I worked all four years with these letters exclusively. And then you, you get quite accompanied with them. And I have to say, the tombstone of uh, Ben Paul is still in Tallinn. <laughs> and when I was ready, I, I bought a red rose and put it onto this, this tomb. And it's in the middle of the uh, tourist district of Tallinn. And you can see a lot of tourists surrounding me <laughs> looking full totally constant and why is this guy taking a red rose on an old medieval tombstone but i was so grateful for him <laughs> wow this is this is a brilliant story i really love it um and i think i think actually this sets us up quite nicely for the um uh, for the next section which is 
which is really about the sort of perception history of the of the Hanses. So, you know, if it was mainly you know a commercial network of um, of merchants trading in beeswax and grain and herring and you know fascinating as that might be, but as you say, you know, probably not quite as much of a political power as um, we've been led to believe for a long time. Why do you think we still care so much about the Hansa? Why are we still looking at this at all? It is the crux or maybe the happiness of the Hansa that the Hanseatic researchers made them independent from the mainstream of research in Germany. Uh, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, the Hanseatic merchants declared themselves as independent not part of the German history. So uh, still today, the, the mainstream medievalists will not accept us as real historians of the medieval times. We are only economic historians. And I have to say, when I, I wrote my, my habilitation, uh, I got one protest, and that was the medievalist in my home university. He said, that's not medieval history, I have wrote. So, um, the, uh, it is lucky for the Hanseatic history because it, it, it was accepted as part of the German history. On the other hand, we, the Germans are totally untouched <laughs> by modern developments, by modern use, and so on. So they are living on their own Hanseatic island, so to speak. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lovely place to be, I guess. But if, if, we, go, if we go back a little bit further into the, into the early 19th century, you know, that's when I understand sort of Hanseatic uh, or the perception of the Hanseatic history uh, began. And it began as sort of uh, an occupation with something that was just so obscure and so uninteresting, the sort of half forgotten antiquities. Is that, is that right? Uh, this, this word from the half forgotten antiquities from Sartorius. And he wrote his book in, in the Napoleon area. And for his, it was really antiquity. It was totally unimportant. But his successor, and there are actually are two, a guy who's called Wurm in Hamburg and his colleague Lappenberg, they looked for uh, the medieval past of the third estate, of the burghers of the new North European cities. And they saw that history in Germany at all was the history of the nobility, the Caesars or the Kaiser, which were Catholic by the way. And so they were looking around and so they found this old antiquity and made it absolute, invented it actually as the medieval history of the proud Hanseatic burghers in northern uh, Germany. And by this, Hansa became a part of the uh, German reunification movement. First, it was a liberal movement, anti-colonial. So the Hanseatics made the first colonies and like the British, they failed in, in colonization. And then it was tax policy and so on. And then at the end of the 19th century, it was more and more militarized. So Hansa has to be the seagoing power of the Germans because ships are the British item of the time. And when a German fleet shall be victorious about uh, over the Brits, they have to have a medieval uh, naval his history. And so they invented the seagoing Hansa. So from a half forgotten antiquity, it was uh, politicized by historians. And we shall not forget that these historians were politicians at the same time. They were a member of the Paul's Parliament and they were later a member of the German Reich Parliament. And they made Germany, they made the remembrance, the ideas and the history of the new German Empire. Well, I guess this is, you know, this is this is a relatively standard process now in, in German history. And, you know, if you look back at the, you know, Ottonians, the Salians, the Hohenstaufen, they've all been pressed into service for, you know, the Bismarck Reich. Um, but there's, there's something quite odd with the Hansa because, you know, when I went to school in the 1980s, um, I still heard the stories about, you know, the Hansa being, you know, that, that great national seafaring power that fought the pirates and the king of Denmark, and, <laughs> you know, was, you know, flying the banner of Germany all across the mm -hmm. Baltic. 
uh, you know, at, at a time when you know we really sort of had revised our views on the um, uh, on the earlier medieval empire emperors. What was going on there? Why is the Hansa story or the Hansa perception so fundamentally different? It happens in two ways. For the first, I have to say, you come as me from from western parts of Germany because yeah. we are, we were still in this uh, in this uh, narrative. In the eastern parts, it changed actually because the Hansa was uh, the the picture of these capitalists. So the rebellion, Klaus Sturtebecker and so on, against the Hansa was much more important than the Hansa itself. So Sturtebecker was the new hero of the 70s, 80s in eastern Germany, and it's it came now to the western part of Germany too. The other way is they the Hanseatic historians found their fig leaf. All these ideas about the Hansa as the bringer of culture, a germanism and uh, blut und boden mm. was was transferred to a so-called neutral foreigner. It was a professor at the University of Strasbourg, Philippe Dolanger, who he was a, a, a in, intimate friend of the German uh, Hansa historians, and he wrote this standard book, Le Hans, and it's the only one which, for, uh, at least, is translated to English too, the Hansa, and he was putting all these national ideas into French language, and by this. It became neutral and was re-translated to Germany and uh, to German, uh, sorry, in the, in the 1960s, 70s. And by this, it was the standard knowledge of the time. So it's the fig leaf of Strasbourg University who made this, or made made this happen that Germans can digest these nationalistic ideas. <laughs> yeah, it's that that is genuinely quite quite bewildering and unusual. Um, th th if I'm not mistaken, there's also something uh, about the archives that hampered normal historical research into the Hanse for you know quite a long time after the Second World War in the West. Yes, in in 1942, when when the Allies tried to their the bombarding of German cities, the arch the most important archives of these uh, northern German towns were brought to a salt mine in Saxon Anhalt. And these salt mines were first looted by American troops. And we lost a part of these documents to America and they never will be found uh, again. And the rest was shipped to the Soviet Union. And by this, the, the documents were lost for research from 1942 when they are packed in up to 1989, 19, when Gorbachev made a gift to Germany and a, a huge part of these uh, archivalias came back and they have to be sorted and, and uh, uh, registered again. So a real new research about Hanseatic Lead could first started in the 1990s. So I'm one of the first uh, who were able to work in the archives. I, I have seen these huge amounts of papers coming back. And sometimes I was the first uh, taken a paper on the hand since 1942. And uh, a remaining rest of our archives from the Hanseatic towns is still in Russia. Until the war, we have had a project in Siberia because one of the most uh, important archives are still there. This is, a, yeah, it, it, it is really quite an unusual thing. And I mean, the other thing that I found quite unusual is, is you know, as I'm sort of reading through uh, the works of various historians looking at the Hanseatic League, I, I, I realize there's a sort of very active European community of historians involved in research around the Hanseatic League. And I mean, I probably can count you amongst those, um, given you're, you're, you're based in Copenhagen. How, how did that come about? Because I guess that was a, you know, more a very German topic in the past. Uh, in the 1980s, 90s, uh, researching Hansa history, history was only a German item. You have to, as a, my older colleague said, if you're no, not uh, able to read German and to talk German, you cannot do it and you shall not do it. Uh, hopefully we, we are out of this dogma today, but um, 
nowadays we see the Hanseatic history as an international phenomenon. And by this, we have quite a lot younger historians uh, around in Europe researching this. I have a very good colleague in Porto. We have some in La Rochelle and in Amsterdam, as in, in Poland and so on. And because Hansa merchants went over all in Europe, they are not the seagoing pirate killers of the 80, uh, 1870s. They are international merchants trading from Cremonia to Greenland and from Novgorod to uh, Northern Africa. So to, research, to make research in Hanseatic history is still a German uh, territory because most of our sources are either in German or in Latin. But the discussions and the ideas are now much more international and I have very highly talented colleagues in Amsterdam, for example, talking five, six, seven languages at the same time. Uh, they, they are fabulous. <laughs> I cannot do this. And um, so and they, they can connect these different areas. And I started at a German university at that time. And I have written, <coughs> sorry, my PhD about the, the herring trade from Denmark to, to uh, the rest of Europe, from Italy to, to Britain. And so it was easy to come to Copenhagen because I've already worked about Danish history at that time. And now I'm changing the Danish view because we have an old tradition as Denmark was the arch enemy of the Hanseatic League and was never collected to this league. And now I can show, okay, dear colleagues, dear friends, Copenhagen was a Hanseatic city. The city of Malmö was a Hanseatic city. You paid the pound toll in the war against Denmark. And latest at this command, they, they totally are on the parigrades and say, no, 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 never, ever. And then I show the document, say, here, look at this, the town seal of Copenhagen into uh, um, a custom toll account and so on. So we, we are still on the way to change national views. We are still on the way to, to shape a new picture of the Hanseatic League. And uh, sometimes... Uh, you will say that's the forerunner of European Union. That's that's not right, but it has the same international dimension as the European Union or the modern economical networks. Because we are still trading with Russia, we are still trading with Africa, even with really, our embargoes. You know, they, they and so we see indeed. the same principles, um, you know, with you, the same methods. You know that I live in London, too. and. Um, and in London, they, or the, 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 the rather unusual thing I find is that the Hansa has a very, very positive connotation in the UK. And quite frankly, there aren't an awful lot of bits of German history that have a particularly strong connotation in the UK. So why did that happen? You know, that the UK, in particular England, is so positive on the, on the Hansa that you know, Kings Lynn claims to be a Hanseatic city, and in in Denmark it is, I think, pretty much the, the opposite. <laughs> the the modern English has misinterpreted the Hansa because in the 19th century, England was beside Denmark the arch enemy of the Hansa. Also, the construct of of the medieval Hansa, also made by the historians, was anti-Danish and anti-English. And we have this quotation from the English king that the Hansa is like a crocodile. You cannot see the whole uh, the whole deer, but you know, it's biting you uh, all the time. And that's not positive at all. And I have no idea why why this change is. Maybe because they saw the the Hanseatic contour in London, and now Cannon Street Station is is a nice one or something like this. It's it's quite amazing because. Uh, Great Britain or England for, for that is one of the few countries in Europe which had an actually positive picture of this. As in Norway, it's the most negative because of the destruction in the Second World War. Denmark is the arch enemies. The Swedes are neutral. The Finns are un uninterested, and the, the Baltic states. Okay, they 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 settled on the Hanseatic League as an anti-Russian movement. Hmm. So when they were part of the Hanseatic League, they were not Russians. And by this, it's positive there. 
But in the rest of Europe, yeah, Hansa, it's a lot of beer, a folk fest, <laughs> and maybe some, some silly ships. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, yes, that is a, uh, uh, probably the perception that quite a lot of people have. But, you know, just on a sort of slightly more serious matter. So, you know, when I'm looking at it um, and I look at the way German history has been interpreted, it feels like, you know, it's it's a real pick and mix. So at some point in the 19th century, some guys went together, sat together, and they decided, well, the Ottonians are part of it, the Salians are part of it, the Hohenstaufen are part of it. Um, and then we just, you know, veer off into the Hanseatic League and the Teutonic Knights and the Eastern Expansion. And we just drop the whole bit in the middle. Um, and then, then then there's Luther. You know, we, have, we just have to find a way to get to Luther. And then past Luther, we get to, to Frederick the Great. And and I'm just, you know, I, I my, the season that comes after the next season will be about the Luxembourgers and about the early Habsburgs. And I feel this is entirely orphan history. You know, the... The, um, uh, the Germans don't sort of own it. Um, the Austrians own the Habsburg bit, but not necessarily the Luxembourg bit. The Czechs own the Luxembourg bit up until Charles IV, and then they're really disinterested when it comes to Sigismund. So I'm wondering, is this standard process? Are there other countries that really <laughs> treat it like a pick and mix? Yeah. I mean, if you're England, you know, you, it's very hard to argue that some stuff didn't happen uh, when it happened. Yes, England, Zion. for example. You know that Richard Lionheart was the most hated and un-English king until 1800. He was the, the symbol of un-Englishness because he never stayed in, in England for longer than four months or so in his reign. And then Walter Scott came and made a new picture of the, the chivalric and heroic River, uh, Richard L uh, Lionheart. And suddenly we have a statue of, of him before the House of Parliament at, West, at Westminster. Uh, this happened actually overall in Europe in the 19th century. Uh, they were, the historians made the idea of nations and nations were in the need of a history and history is too long. There are too many facts, there are too many kings, there are too many persons. You have to choose. And uh, the historians of the 19th century, they chose people, kings at least, who were helpful in their political agenda in the 19th century. And by this, Richard, uh, uh, Richard Leinhardt was made the English king par excellence. And he is a, a various king. He is a warrior. He fought against the Arabs, so he's useful still, and so on and so on. And it's uh, the opinion of the 19th century that formed our view of history. So uh, every nation in, German, uh, in, in Europe, even in America, has its own historical narrative. And in this narrative, you're pointing to two, three peaks and the Hansar is a secondary peak in Germany. Also, Ottonians, Frederick II, those are the main heroes of, of history writing. And then the Habsburgians and the Luxembourgians, they were too Catholic because we have this differentiation the, between the northern uh, Protestantic and the southern Catholic part. So all the Habsburgian, Luxembourgian history, it was what is outside uh, history because they are not true Christians at all. And so we have to find secondary places. And Hansa is one because the Hanseatic merchants in, in this history uh, narrative were never Catholic. So I, I have been in, in Lübeck and, and talked about processions, also these Catholic processions around the, the streets. And they were looking to me and no, 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 that never happens. Also, never ever in, in, in Lübeck. No, no, no trace of, of Catholicism in this bu uh, in the city, sorry. So um, that's the main opinion. The, the, uh, the Hanseatic merchant is a proto protestantic Viberian uh, uh, merchants, like the prototype of the, m the modern. Uh, uh, yeah, what's, what's called? the modern merchant in, in, in huge companies and so on. So the construction of history is actually made by people in, in political purposes of that time. And by this, some of the, this, these construction disappeared again. So the Atonians and Frederick II disappeared after the Second World War. 
the the Prussians disappear too. Also the um, uh, the victory at Fabelline or the the great uh, um, Kurfürst. You have never heard about them, but some could uh, survive by reasons not totally clear. And the Hanseatic merchants survived because these merchants were so so nice to talk about. They picture books about Hanseatic merchants and ships. They are so exotic, and these these merchants and the pirates. They are so great, and but the the view is shifting. In the in one of the main gates or routes in Hamburg is, is Citron, uh, Simon von Utrecht Allee. It's one of the uh, huge uh, uh, roads going into the town. No one in Germany, or in Hamburg at least, know who Simon von Utrecht is or was. He was actually uh, the guy who who caught uh, Stortebecker. Assuming so that he actually in the, in the 19th century. You know, he Stoltenberg is a myth. He 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 existed, but he was not captured uh, or, or ca uh, captured in Hamburg. So in the 19th century, Simon von Utrecht was the symbol of the proud German merchant. And then it changed. Today, everyone knows Stoltenberg. We have beer, we have festivities, and so on. And by this, both are connected to the Hansa, but the view to to the Hansa that's mm -hmm. changed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, talking about sort of, you know, forgotten people, or the other person that doesn't seem to be in anybody's consciousness much is uh, is Wollenweber. I mean, I, you know, apart from Lübeck itself, but, but outside Lübeck, I don't think many people know about his existence. Yes. Also, he's like Con uh, Cromwell. He destroyed a lot without a concept and he lost and uh, he's not a Lübecker at all. He comes from Hamburg. Uh, he came from Hamburg. And so uh, the next point is that Protestant history is on the way out. As a Wollen Weber is known because of the Protestant Reformation, he and the greatness of a war against a Catholic king of Denmark. But uh, this this kind of uh, radical Protestantism, it's not longer modern. Also, at least in the moment. And by this, Wollenweber is uh, actually not longer known in Germany. And I'm, I will say, even the Lübeckers do not know him anymore. Well, they, they still have a restaurant named after him. And, you know, I, I do share your view about uh, Wollenweber's <laughs> you know, lack of success and uh, skills. And um, still, you know, when I, when I published the episode on, on that story, I got quite a lot of pushback from Lübeckers saying, no, no, we name roads after him and restaurants and so forth. And we, you know, we're very proud of him. So maybe he's not entirely forgotten. So there are much more important people like Kastrup or Griverrader, also my heroes from, from the 15th century, than, than Wollenweber. So um, I edited sometimes letters from, from Lübeck in Wollenweber time, and even the, the Lübeckians saw as the first they uh, are like revolutionaries and total blind. And over the years, they could say, okay, maybe this was a failure. Maybe that's not quite as good as he said it and so on. Uh, again, it's, it's a question of how you const construct and, and made the history. Also, what are the heroes of your of your past? Are this, these huge uh, reformatories who plundered churches, who destroyed art, to melt uh, the silver of the altars to, to make cannons? Or are this the, the builder of the Holstein Tour, for example, and so on? Also, it's, it's a, you have to choose. And the Lubbyans choose once, and now they have the opportunity to, to choose again, I think. <laughs> I, I think we could probably go on for hours on, on this and um, talk more about uh, Kastorp and uh, and your your heroes as opposed to the ones that uh, that I found in the books. But um, maybe for 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 the listeners, do you have any kind of strong recommendations of um, books or papers uh, that really you know they're compelling, they're new, and they're bringing in? you know, the, these new aspects that um, uh, that you've been highlighting. Um, and, and ideally, if there were in English, that'd be even better. 
So the new trends are how the, the merchants struggle with each other. Uh, so the German is conf uh, conflict solution, or in, in English. Uh, so how it, it works, how does a network really works inside? Because we, we only see the network struggling with others, with the British and, and the Danish. But how, how could it work when two merchants with different interests come in conflict and so on? And there's a, a huge uh, project in the University of, of Amsterdam and there, for example, is a, a new book by Christian Manger about uh, conflict solution in the Baltic Sea area uh, between Rival and Lübeck in the, in the 16th century. And um, this is one of the things I can recommend. And for those who can read uh, Littmore French, one of the warm and hot topics in the moment is the French Hanseatic mer uh, merchandise, because that's a, a really unknown area and we can see that there's a, a triangular trade between England, France and Germany at that time uh, going up to Paris and wow. Rouen and so on and the Hanse Hanseatic merchants are deep involved in this triangular trade so it's not only Hamburg, Lübeck or uh, London or London uh, Gdansk, it's much more and it's also the trade with this, uh, Spain and, and uh, Portugal for example even in time when or a trade with the Muslim area. So we are looking at broader aspects of Hanseatic trade now. Yeah, and I, I think I came across this story of a um, of a Hamburg captain who ended up as a you know pirate vessel uh, uh, captain on the Barbary coast. It's... Hmm. Uh, the English are eating f figgy pudding now. And that's the medieval form of tofu, and the figs were produced in the Arab world, and then they were transported by Hanseatic merchants to Southampton, into Aelia. So this is the, the trade we are interested. So the the, the pirates and uh, the Arabs who plundered Iceland once and so on, they are very fascinating. But we have this constant connection also in time of war, for example. And uh, I'm writing in the moment an article between of the trade between Nigeria and, and Lübeck. And actually, there has been this kind of trade by steps and so on, or the trade from India to uh, to the Hanseatic area. And we can say there is the city of Mecca as a stop in and Alexandria and so on. And that's that's quite interesting. And the people know about this. Wow, it, it it looks like I've got to do another season on uh, the Hanseatic League in about two years' time. Once you've <laughs> dug up all this, uh, all this other absolutely fascinating yeah. research. Um, but let me just, you know, thank you so much a, for coming onto the podcast, but also for um, all the work you've done on um, on the Hanseatic network on Bernd Pal. Uh, it really was a uh, a hugely helpful thing to me, and I hope for the listeners to to really understand how the Hansa work and on on based on based on an actual human, a human one 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 can relate to, and um, that was that was really fascinating. So it was it was a real privilege to talk to you in um, in person. So thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you for your interest in the Hansa, Hansa or the Hanseatic League. Yeah, absolutely. There is a lot of interest in the Hanseatic League, fortunately. And uh, for all listeners to the history of the Germans, um, we will come back now with the Teutonic Knights. Hopefully next week, um, worst case, the week after that, and um, you know that will be a season f probably about four or five episodes, maybe six. That'll take us to the end of the year, early January, and after that we'll go back to our emperors. Uh, we're going to go from the uh, the end of the Hohenstaufen to the um, uh, the Luxembourgers, so Charles the Fourth and uh, the Empress Sigismund. Pretty sure that's going to be a very, very interesting ride. Uh, and I hope to see you all there.